ladies and gentlemen, thank you, and congratulations for coming to the conference in spite of the best efforts of um, Mr. Mick Lynch, who seemed to wish to get in the way. But thank you for being here, because you are the beating heart of the Conservative Party. You're the stalwarts who do all the work for us and make sure people like me get elected. So I thank you for all you do for conservatism and supporting us so much. Uh, that you make it work. You make sure we have conservative governments. And your getting here was proof of that. And some of you may think that I should be going around the trains, putting out little calling cards, saying how much I look forward to seeing people back at work soon. <laughs> um, because actually, we have... We have a tireless quest for productivity in this country, and we need to make sure that everybody is working efficiently, and we want them, obviously, to be working in their proper places of work. But also I want to thank you for giving me almost as warm a welcome as I got outside the hall. Um, <laughs> but I think that's rather marvellous. I happen to think that having a democracy where you can actually walk through the streets and people can exercise their right to peaceful protest shows the strength of our society. And if people really want to call me Tory scum, I don't mind. <laughs> and, and it has to be said, walking through the beautiful streets of Birmingham, turned blue once again, or turning blue once again, to the, thanks to the great efforts of Andy Street, uh, is a great privilege, and it's lovely to be here and, and to be here with this fantastic audience and to be speaking to you as business secretary. Um, and I'm going to reintroduce a great tradition that uh, secretaries of state used to have when they came into the conference of introducing my brilliant ministerial team. So my fellow cabinet minister, uh, Graham Stewart, is here as minister for climate. Jackie Doyle Price is here as minister for industry. Nusrat Ghani, Minister for Science and Investment Security, Dean Russell, Minister for Enterprise and Markets, and Lord Callanan, who I can't actually see here, but is a, nonetheless a very great man, uh, is the Minister for Business, Energy and Corporate Responsibility. I am so lucky to be supported by what I think is the A team of ministers, and you can tell that to all the other departments who only have B teams, so let's be clear that I have, I have the A team supporting me. But it's also quite fun to be speaking for the first time uh, in all the years I've been a Member of Parliament from the main stage. I did once in the old days when I was the candidate in the Reekin get up to the main stage, but that was only for about three minutes, and I've got a bit longer now. But it makes a change. I used to do um, the rounds of the fringes, when sometimes I wasn't entirely in line with what the government was then doing. So it's nice to be on the main stage and leaving the fringes to certain other right honourable friends of mine who seem to be having a jolly time. Um, but instead, I'm here in full support and honoured to serve a first-class Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister, since she took office, has completed about a year's government business in a fortnight. And I'm glad to say, I think the Prime Minister, and I say this as Minister for Energy, is a genuine dynamo and is producing electric fields that are making sure that things get done. And she knows how urgent the challenges we face are. And the challenges are particularly in energy. First of all, affordability this winter. Second, securing energy supplies. And third, what I would like to call intelligent net zero. And how are we tackling those challenges? Well, rapidly is the answer. As the opposition sniped and catcalled and did what it usually does, we got on with it. We worked properly, night and day, and actually the civil servants in Bays worked incredibly long hours to create the energy price guarantee for households and the energy bill relief scheme for businesses. We have ensured that the British people, families and businesses, will get help now, from the 1st of October, with energy price support that took effect on Saturday regardless of where they live in the United Kingdom and however they get their energy. His Majesty's Government has acted with speed and foresight to deliver this protection for households throughout the entire kingdom. And the same is true for... Thank you. Somebody agrees with me. That's so nice. I... You've all been here a very long time, so the fact that one person is paying attention is a great relief. I'm much... I'm very much obliged. Um, 
And so the same is true for businesses. We have averted a genuine economic disaster by protecting businesses, charities, and public services, including schools and hospitals, particularly care homes, from catastrophic rises in their energy costs. We did this, we had to do this, because of Putin's monstrous invasion of Ukraine. It seems that his ambition is to make Ivan the Terrible look like Padre Pio. And his, his wicked acts, wicked acts, are for, what forced up the price of gas to an extent that would have ruined almost every business and left virtually every family unable to afford their energy. I actually said to a journalist from The Sun that the only person who could have afforded an energy bill this winter would have been the proprietor of The Sun. Everyone else would have been in penury. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, we have done what we have done, not some blunt instrument that our socialist counterparts might have used, but a well-designed, effective way of getting support to all and a support that will decline as the energy price normalises. Now, you are proper conservatives, aren't you? You are the bluest of the blue. And there may be some of you who think it's not conservative to intervene in this way. But I would say that there was no question that we had to come to the British people's aid. We could not let people face this winter alone. This is actually fundamentally what the state is there for, to do the things for people that they cannot do for themselves. Some burdens are too great for individuals and families to bear, and these must be borne by the nation herself. These are the burdens of security, of policing, of defense. And this action is an act of defense for our people, every bit as much as making munitions or tanks. And our great hero, I expect he's a great hero of all of you, scanning this hall, even before you know who I'm going to say, I'm confident that this man is a great hero, many of you. Adam Smith himself, the father of free marketeers, the paterfamilias of economic theory, put the defense of the nation above all else. He told us that the Navigation Acts, which you will all recall from your O-level history, against the Dutch, it's quite interesting, you know all those things we say about Dutch courage and so on and so forth, all come from the 17th century wars we fought against the Dutch. Um, but he said the Navigation Acts were the wisest of all the commercial regulations of England because they stopped a then hostile nation, and just the record, we're now very friendly with the Dutch, um, harming Britain. Defence, Adam Smith said, was of much more importance than opulence. And what he meant by that was it was worth the short-term cost to defend Britain from national animosity. And as so often what was true in the 18th century is true today. The war may not be on our shores, but we will defend the United Kingdom against Mr. Putin's evil. And our decisive thank you. And our decisive action will save millions of families and businesses from penury. And you know what? Imitation is the greatest form of flattery. We're being imitated by our German friends who have rolled out an almost a carbon copy scheme. So this intervention, helping families from falling into debt and misery through crippling energy costs imposed on them by a tyrant in Moscow, has averted a disaster for Britain's small businesses this winter, salvaging the livelihoods that would have been destroyed. So this winter, we are once again standing together with the British people. But there is more to do because we have to make sure that this doesn't occur again. We must act to provide energy security and to use our energy better. But the more we produce, the more affordable the scheme we have introduced will be. Energy supply, cheap energy, is the foundation of our prosperity. Our reserves of coal and the pursuit of new technologies to dig it out no, no, I'm going back to history, I'm sorry. I'm not advocating coal now. I, I, I'm disappointing one person in the audience. Um, <laughs> digging it out of the ground spurred the Industrial Revolution. The discovery of North Sea oil and gas, combined with Mrs Thatcher's visionary leadership, turbocharged the British economy in the 1980s. And now our future prosperity depends on our ability to secure affordable energy in abundance. High energy costs have made our industries uncompetitive 
and increased the cost of building roads and railways. They have often meant the difference between business choosing to invest in the United Kingdom or turning their backs. So we have an energy supply task force led by the highly esteemed Maddie McTurn, who delivered the vaccines that rescued us from the COVID pandemic, and she is moving to secure our energy supplies in the coming months. Our aim is secure, cheap and plentiful supplies, the veritable engine of economic growth. Now that may lead socialist commentators to paint me as a fossil fuel junkie. <laughs> but I am neither a fossil fuel junkie, nor, it has to be said, a junkie of any other variety. So let me reassure you um, that I'm committed to net zero by 2050. But the green agenda does not mean an agenda of poverty. It does not contradict the growth agenda. So if we will go green in a way that makes the British people better off not worse off, drives growth instead of hindering it, levels up by boosting industries in our regions instead of imposing costs that drive them to the brink of ruin. The faddish Islingtonian Labour Party was happy to destroy industries like steel by imposing needless costs on their energy, which wasn't just unfair, it was ungreen, and simply forced manufacturing overseas, making us import more polluting products. We need intelligent greenery, not religious zealotry. And so, and as for the socialist ideas of a nationalised energy dream, that would do nothing but create shortages, rationing and intermittency. So, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard me called before, no doubt, the Honourable Member for the 18th century, actually right Honourable Member nowadays, I, I mustn't forget uh, the, the, the promotion I was kindly given by the great Boris Johnson who put me in um, Her Majesty's uh, Privy Council. But it's not an insult to me, because the Georgians were pioneers, innovators, inventors of the power loom and the spinning jenny, the fathers of the Industrial Revolution. Think of Jethro Tull whose seed drill transformed agriculture, the beginnings of the agricultural revolution. Now, some of you thought he was a pop star, but actually we're talking about agricultural innovation. Matthew Bolton of this great city and James Watt, who developed the steam engine that powered the industrial revolution. It is that spirit of progress that this government must capture, which is why we are moving full steam ahead with carbon capture and storage, expanding the world's biggest wind farm at Dogger Bank developing hydrogen and nuclear, including modular nuclear reactors. But the most exciting may be fusion. Now, bear in mind, Isaac Newton believed in the Philosopher's Stone and thought that you could turn base metals into gold. So fusion is a great hope. It is a potential ace up our sleeve, but it'd be silly of me not to pretend that it's difficult. It offers unparalleled potential for clean power production, promising a future of inexhaustible energy that could unshackle us from hydrocarbons and make us truly self-sufficient and secure. But the technological hurdles are big. Fusion reactors must apparently sustain a temperature 10 times hotter than the sun, which whether you use centigrade or, like me, prefer Fahrenheit, is nonetheless very hot. Um, <laughs> the containment of which requires magnets so strong that they could lift an aircraft carrier clean out of the ocean. We get one of those, that might make uh, Mr. Putin's Navy find life rather difficult if we just pick it up with magnet. Anyway, reminds me of the, um, uh, is it uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, where Jaws gets lifted up by a magnet that picks his teeth. That wasn't in my official text, so I hope it doesn't make it too difficult to translate it. Um, but over the decades, we have established ourselves in, as pioneers in fusion science. And as a country, our capability to surmount these obstacles is unparalleled. And I'm delighted to make an announcement about the step in that mission. We will build the UK's first prototype fusion energy plant in Nottinghamshire, replacing the West Burton coal-fired power station with a beacon of bountiful green energy. The plant will be the first of its kind, built by 2040, and capable of putting energy on the grid. And in doing so, it will prove the commercial viability of fusion energy to the world. It will create thousands of highly skilled, well, yeah, excellent. I think, you know, I, and, 
And I hope, I hope somebody will clip that as a round of applause for the good people of West Burton in Nottinghamshire for what they are managing to do for this nation. So it could be an industry worth billions of pounds to the UK economy and position the UK to design, manufacture and export the first fleet of fusion plants, putting us in the vanguard of a market with the potential to be worth trillions of pounds a year. But in the meantime, we've got to have some energy in the meantime, and do you realise we got some last week? Because we got enough hot air from the Socialist Conference to keep the turbines spinning for decades to come. You are kind. You are, I, I, and what a marvellous audience. You laugh at the most terrible jokes. I am very grateful. I have a penchant for terrible jokes. I, I hope there aren't too many more. Um, but what we're talking about is environmentalism that is about prosperity, about opportunity, and not about lectures. Now, we've been having a discussion about shale gas, and I want to contextualise that, because I know not everybody is keen on it, and we have to get community support for shale gas. That is of fundamental importance. Um, but Lord Deben wrote to my predecessor, he's the chairman of the Climate Change Committee, saying that shale gas can provide 2 to 63 grams per kilowatt hour of carbon dioxide equivalent less than from LNG being imported. What I mean, and that illustrates what I mean about intelligent net zero. It's about making decisions that reduce carbon but also make us more prosperous. Doesn't mean everything that I say is going to happen tomorrow, but it's about a program that makes sure we don't harm our industry so that we go green in ways that create rather than destroying prosperity. Because cheap energy is essential to a flourishing economy, but in a way it's the foundation of a flourishing economy. There's more to do. So that's why we are looking at supply side reforms that go much further. We've already at this conference announced that the definition of small and medium-sized enterprises will expand from 250 employees to 500. Extra Thank you. One more person agrees. This is great. You know, I mean, this is absolutely marvellous. It's so good. I get one person to agree, and then some of you join in. So the more of that, the better. This is what we need at a Conservative conference. And I know you've all been here for hours, probably gasping for a cup of tea. And I'm not going to detain you too much longer. But thank you to the gentleman over there who um, is delighted that we're going up to 500 rather than 250 employees for a small and medium-sized enterprise, extricating them from a host of regulatory burdens, including costly non-financial reporting requirements, which are simply paper shuffling. Well, in my case, um, not so much um, paper as parchment, but then I have to <laughs> stop. Um, but the structural reforms that we're about to deliver include the Bre Brexit Freedoms Bill. The Brexit Freed Freedoms Bill is a fantastic piece of legislation, defining constitutional piece of legislation that will remove the dead hand of EU laws from our statute book finally. There are over 2,400 EU laws that will be amended or appealed, and any EU regulation which remains will no longer apply to these SMEs of, two, of up to 500 employees, and, <laughs> and thanks to this Prime Minister, we're going to get it done by the end of 2023. It is full speed ahead. <laughs> this this will take more businesses out of the clutches of overbearing regulation, freeing the British economy further and making us more competitive. But we've also got to deal with strikes. We've got to keep Britain moving. Isn't that what it says somewhere up here? Yes. And we've got to keep Britain moving by making it harder to have strikes that bring the nation to a halt. So the Prime Minister promised in her campaign that we would legislate for minimum service levels for essential services to ensure that the modernisation of our economy is not held to ransom by union militancy. And bear in mind, Owen Jones came up to me today and had a go at the funders of the Tory party. The funders of the Tory party don't buy the right to have a say in the leadership, do they? And the Socialist Party, they, they hold the Socialist Party to ransom these unions, and they also want to try and hold the country to ransom. So, the minimum service levels will make that harder, and we will be making that bill a reality soon. And it is a great... <laughs> a 
and if I may use a rude word, it is a great modernization. Uh, well, what? <laughs> but we also need to improve R&D. My department, the department I now lead, spends billions of pounds of taxpayers' money each year on R&D, and that must be a focus for value for money and turning our innovations into inventions. We're doing that with nuclear technology, but we need to make sure that every pound spent is delivered. And I'm delighted that ARIA um, has such good and strong leadership and will be able to help ensure that we turn seed capital in R&D into real investment value for the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, we know these are difficult times. And historic mistakes on energy policy have led us to where we are. But it's always the Conservatives who are best at dealing with difficult situations and make us take those tough decisions that aren't necessarily immediately popular. And this doesn't matter whether it's in nuclear or in shale or in deregulation. Cheap energy and supply-side reforms will provide us with economic growth. And the pressure of difficult times is forcing us in the direction where we need to go. You, ladies and gentlemen, are so fundamental as advocates and ambassadors for that because you are the Toryist of the Tory. And you know how the country should be governed and it's why we need your support. We, together, have a nation-defining mission to complete. And I rely on you to complete it.